Chapter 11 of The City at World's End by Edmund Hamilton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The City at World's End, Chapter 11 Revelation. The crew of the Thanis came into New Middletown that afternoon, and Keniston and Carroll and all the rest of the city's thousands watched them come. There were two score of them a hard-handed, alert, capable breed, no different from all the sailors Keniston had ever seen, though their seas were the incalculable deeps of outer space and their faces were darkened by the rays of alien suns. Across the blowing dust of this world that had bred and lost them, they came, and with them were the others Piers Eglin had spoken of, the strange children of other stars. Keniston had explained about these aliens to Carol, who had seen no more than the tips of Gore Hall's furry ears, and had supposed, like the others, that he was only a peculiar kind of pet. He didn't think that she had really understood him, any more than the people of New Middletown had really understood the mayor's similar explanation. "'From Vega,' Carol had said, and shivered, looking toward the dim sky where the stars showed even in daylight. "'They can't be like us, Ken.' No human being could ever go out there and still be like us." Keniston was startled to hear his own thoughts repeated in her voice, but he said reassuringly, "'They can't have changed too much. And the others, the humanoids, they may look queer, but they're our friends.' It was what Mayor Garris had told his people. "'Whatever these newcomers are like, they've got to be treated right and there's a jail cell waiting for anyone who makes trouble with them. Do you all get that? No matter what they look like, act as though they're people." Hearing is one thing, seeing another. And now Carol's fingers closed tight on Keniston's hand, and her body shrank against his, and the crowd who had gathered to watch this second entrance of the incredible into their midst stared and whispered and moved uneasily. One of these aliens was big and bulky, walking stodgily on massive legs. His wrinkled gray skin hung in heavy folds. His face was broad and flat and featureless, with little, wise old eyes that glanced with shrewd understanding at the staring, silent crowd. Two were lean and dark, moving like conspirators wrapped in black cloaks. Their narrow heads were hairless and their glance was bright and full of madcap humor. Keniston realized with a shock that the cloaks they wore were wings, folded close around their bodies. There was another, who had peculiar gliding grace that hinted of unguessed strength and speed, and whose bearing was very cool and proud. He was handsome, with a mane of snow-white fur sweeping back from his brow and there was only a faint touch of cruelty in his broad cheekbones and straight, smiling mouth. These four, and Gore Hall, were manlike but not men, children of far worlds walking with easy confidence on old earth. "'They're horrible,' whispered Carol, drawing away. "'Unholy! How can you stand to be near them?' Keniston was fighting down much the same reaction. The Middletowners gaped and muttered and drew back, partly from a creeping fear of the unnatural, partly from sheer racial resentment. It was hard enough to accept the fact that such non-human people existed at all. It was harder still to accept them as equals. Beast was beast and man was man, and there was no middle ground. But not to Middletown's children. They ignored the bronzed spacemen and clustered in droves around the humanoids. They had none of their elders' preconceptions. These were creatures out of fairy tales come alive, and the children loved them. Piers Eglin came up to Keniston. Keniston said, Hubble has the main generator rooms opened up. He's waiting for us there. I'll take you. Eglin sighed. Thank you, he said. He seemed desperately unhappy. Keniston said a hasty good-bye to Carol and fell in beside the little historian. "'What's wrong?' he said. "'My orders,' said Piers Eglin. "'I am to interpret and to teach some of you our language.' 
he shook his head dismally. It will take days, and that old city of yours, I should be in it every moment." Keniston smiled. "'I'll try to learn fast,' he said. He led the way to where Hubble was waiting by the generators, and behind him he heard the eerie footfalls of the creatures who were not human and it was incredible to him that he was going to have to work beside these weird beings who gave him a cold shiver every time he came near them. Surely they could not behave like men. They went into the building, into an enormous room filled with the towering, dusty shapes of armored mechanisms that he and Hubble had not been able to make head or tail of. The senior scientist joined them, looking askance at the humanoids. Keniston said, we supposed that these were the main generators. He spoke to Pierre Eglin, since Eglin must do the translating, but he was facing Gore Hall and the four others who stood beside him. If they can really repair and start them, we— His voice trailed off. The five pairs of alien eyes regarded him, the five alien bodies breathed and stirred, and the crest of white fur on the proud one's skull lifted in a way so beast-like that it was impossible for Keniston to pretend any longer to accept them as human. Doubt, distrust, and just a hint of fear crept into his face. Piers Eglin frowned a little and started to speak. With the suddenness of a bat darting out in the evening, one of the lean dark brothers whipped wide his wings and made a little spring at Keniston, uttering a cry that sounded very much like, Boo! Keniston leaped backward, startled almost out of his skin, and the lean one promptly doubled up with laughter, which was echoed by the others. Even the large gray creature smiled. They all looked at Keniston and laughed, and presently Hubble got it and began to laugh too, and after that there was nothing for Keniston to do but join in. The joke was on him at that. They had known perfectly well how he felt about them and the lean one had paid him back in his own coin, but with humor and not malice. And somehow, after they had laughed together, the tension was gone. Laughter is a human sort of thing. Keniston mumbled something, and Gore Hall slapped his shoulder, nearly putting him on his face. But when he approached the dusty generators, Gore Hall changed abruptly from a shambling, good-natured creature into a highly efficient technician. He operated hidden catches and had a shield panel off one of the big mechanisms before Keniston saw how he did it. He drew a flat pocket flash from a pouch on his harness and used it for light as he poked his hairy, bullet-shaped head inside the machine. His low, rumbling comments came out of the bowels of the generator. Finally, Gore Hall withdrew his head from the machine and spoke disgustedly. Eglin translated. He says, this old installation is badly designed and in poor condition. He says he would like to get his hands on the technician who would do a job like this. Keniston laughed again. The big furry capellan sounded like a blood brother to every repair technician on old earth. While Gore Hall examined the other generators, Piers Eglin fastened onto Hubble and Keniston, deluging them with questions about their own remote time. They managed at last to ask a question of their own, one that was big in their minds, but that they'd had no chance to ask before. Why is Earth lifeless now? What happened to all its people? Piers Eglin said, Long ago, Earth's people went out to other worlds, not so much to the other planets of this system. The outer ones were cold, and watery Venus had too small a land surface but to the worlds of other stars across the galaxy. But surely some of them would have stayed on Earth, said Keniston. Eglin shrugged. They did, until it grew so cold that even in these domed cities life was difficult. Then the last of them went to the worlds of warmer suns. Keniston said, In our day we hadn't even reached the moon. He felt a little dazed by it all. To the worlds of other stars across the galaxy. Gore Hall finally came back to them and rumbled lengthily. 
Eglin translated. He thinks they can get the generators going, but it'll take time and he'll need materials, copper, magnesium, some platinum. They listened carefully, and Hubble nodded and said, We can get all those for you in old Middletown. The old city? cried Piers Eglin eagerly. I will go with you. Let us start at once. The little historian was afire for a look at the old town. He fidgeted until he and Hubble and Keniston, in a jeep, were driving across the cold ochre wasteland. "'I shall see, with my own eyes, a town of the pre-atomic age!' he exulted. It was strange to come upon old Middletown, standing so silent in the midst of desolation. The houses were as he had last seen them, the doors locked, the empty porch swings rocking in the cold wind. The streets were drifted thick with dust. The trees were bare, and the last small blade of grass had died. Keniston saw that Hubble's eyes were misted, and his own heart contracted with a terrible pang of longing. He wished that he had not come. But in that other city, absorbed in the effort to survive, one could almost forget that there had been a life before. He drove the jeep through these deathly streets, and memory spoke to him strongly of lost summers, girls in bright frocks, catalpa trees heavy with blossom, the quarreling of wrens, and the lights and sounds of human voices in the drowsy evening. Piers Eglin was speechless with joy, lost in a historian's dream as he walked the streets and looked into shops and houses. "'It must be preserved,' Eglin whispered. It's too precious. I will have them build a dome and seal it all, the signs, the artifacts, the beautiful scraps of paper." Hubble said abruptly, "'There's someone here ahead of us.' Keniston saw the small bullet-shaped car that stood outside the old lab. Out of the building came Norden Lund and Varn Allen. She spoke to Eglin, and he translated. They have been gathering data for her report to Government Center." Keniston saw the distaste in the woman's clear-cut face as her blue eyes rested on the panorama of grimy mills, the towering stacks black with forgotten smokes, the rustling rails of the sidings, the drab little houses huddled along the narrow streets. He resented it, and said defiantly, "'Ask her what she thinks of our little city.' Eglin did, and Varn Allen answered incisively. The little historian looked uneasy when Keniston asked him to interpret. Varn Allen says that it is unbelievable people could live in a place so pitiful and sordid. Lund laughed. Keniston flushed hot, and for a moment he detested this woman for her cool, imperious superiority. She looked at old Middletown as one might look at an unclean ape's den. Hubble saw his face and laid a hand on his arm. Come on, Ken, we have work to do. He followed the older man into the lab, Piers Eglin trailing along. He said, Why the hell would they put a haughty blonde in authority? Hubble said, Presumably because she's competent to fill the job. Don't tell me old-fashioned masculine vanity is bothering you." Piers Eglin had understood what they were saying, for he chuckled. "'That's not such an old-fashioned feeling. Norden Lund doesn't much like being sub for a girl.' When they came out of the building with the materials Gore Hall had requested, Varn Allen and Lund were gone. They found, upon their return to New Middletown, that Gore Hall and his crew were already at work disassembling the generators. Bellowing orders, thundering deep-chested Capellan profanity, attacking each generator as though it were a personal enemy, Gore Hall drove his hard-handed spacemen into performing miracles of effort. Keniston, in the days that followed, forgot all sense of strangeness in the intense technical interest of the work. Laboring as he could, eating and sleeping with these star-worlders through the long days and nights, he began to pick up the language with amazing speed. Piers Eglin was eager to help him, 
and after Keniston discovered that the basic structure of the tongue was that of his own English, things went more easily. He discovered one day that he was working beside the humanoids as naturally as though he had always done it. It no longer seemed strange that Magro, the handsome, white-furred Spiken, was an electronics expert whose easy, unerring work left Keniston staring. The brothers, Ban and Bal, were masters at refitting. Keniston envied their deafness without worn parts, the swift ease with which their wiry bodies flitted bat-like among the upper levels of the towering machines, where it was hard for men to go. And La Lore, the old grey stodgy one of the massive body, who spoke little but saw much from wise little eyes, had an amazing mathematical genius. Keniston discovered it when La Lore went with him and Hubble and Piers Eglin to look at the big heat shaft that seemed to go down to the bowels of the earth. The historian nodded comprehendingly as he looked at the great shaft and its conduits. It descended, he said, to the earth's inmost core. It was great work. It, and others like it, in these domed cities, kept earth habitable ages longer than would otherwise have been the case. But there is no more heat in earth's core to tap now. He sighed. The doom of all planets, sooner or later, even after their sun has waned they can live while their interior heat keeps them warm, but when that interior planetary heat dies the planet must be abandoned." Lalor spoke in his throaty, husky voice, "'But John Arnall, as you know, claims that a dead cold planet can be revived, and his equations seem unassailable and the bulk gray Myron, for that star had bred him, Keniston had learned, repeated a staggering series of equations that Keniston could not even begin to follow. Piers Eglin, for some reason, looked oddly uncomfortable. He seemed to avoid Lalor's gaze as he said hastily, "'John Arnall is an enthusiast, a fanatic theorist. You know what happened when he tried a test.' As soon as Keniston could make himself understood in the new tongue, Piers Eglin considered that his duty was done and he departed for old Middletown, to shiver and freeze and root joyfully among the archaic treasures that abounded in every block. Left alone with the star-worlders, Keniston found himself more and more forgetting differences of time and culture and race as he worked with them to force life back into the veins of the city. They had New Middletown's water system in full operation again, and the luxury of opening one of the curious taps and seeing water gush forth in endless quantities was a wonderful thing. Many of the great atomic generators were functioning now, including a tremendous auxiliary heating system which made the air inside the dome several degrees warmer. And Gore Hall and Magro had been working hard on the last miracle of all. There came a night when the big Capellan called Keniston into one of the main generator rooms. Magro and a number of the crewmen were there, smeared with dust and grease, but grinning the happy grins of men who had just seen the last of a hard job. Gore Hall pointed to a window. "'Stand over there,' he said to Keniston, "'and watch.' Keniston looked out over the dark city. There was no moon, and the towers were cloaked in shadow the black canyons of the streets below them pricked here and there with the feeble glints of candles and the few electric bulbs that shone around the city hall. Gore Hall strode across the room behind him, to a huge control panel half the height of the wall. He grunted. There was a click and a snap as the master switch went home, and suddenly, over that nighted city under the dome, there burst a brilliant flood of light the shadowy towers lit to a soaring glow. The streets became rivers of white radiance, soft and clear, and above it all there was a new night sky, the wondrous luminescence of the dome, like a vast bowl fashioned out of moonbeams and many-colored clouds, crowning the gleaming towers with a glory of its own. It was so strange and beautiful, 
after the long darkness and the shadows, that Keniston stood without moving, looking at the miracle of light, and was aware only later that there were tears in his eyes. The sleeping city woke. The people poured out into the shining streets, and the sound of their voices rose and became one long shout of joy. Keniston turned to Gore Hall and Magro and the others. He wanted to say something, but he could not find any words. Finally he laughed, and they laughed with him, and they went out together into the streets. Mayor Garris met them almost at once, having run all the way from City Hall. Hubble was with him, and most of the men from the old lab, and a crowd of Middletowners. There was no making any sense out of anything that was said, but the people hoisted Gore Hall and Magro and the crewmen to their shoulders and rode them in a triumphal procession around the plaza, and the shouts and cheers were deafening. More than water, more than heat, the people treasured this gift of light, and on that night they accepted the humanoids as brothers. A little later, a breathless and jubilant group gathered in City Hall, Gore Hall and Magro, Keniston, Hubble, and the Mayor. Bertram Garris wrung the big Capellan's mighty paw and beamed at Magro, trying to express his thanks for all that they and the others had done, and Gore Hall listened, grinning. "'What's he saying?' he asked Keniston, who now occupied the position of interpreter. Keniston laughed. He wants to know what he can do to show his appreciation, like giving you the city, or his daughter in marriage, or a few pints of his blood. Seriously, Gore, we are all mighty grateful. You people have made the city live again. And, well, is there anything we can do to show you we mean it?" Gore Hall considered. He looked at Magro, and Magro nodded solemnly. Gore Hall said, "Well." Being primitives, we could use a drink." Hubble, who had picked up a smattering of the language, began to laugh. Keniston translated for the mayor, who immediately proclaimed a medical emergency and hastened to produce bottles from the hoard. It was a cheerful celebration, and Keniston found himself actively missing Bal and Ban and the Grey Lalore, who had returned to the ship with part of the crew a day or so before. An unhappy thought occurred to him, and he said, "'I suppose you people will be going away pretty soon, now that the work's done.' Magro shrugged his supple shoulders. "'That will depend on a number of things.' He glanced lazily at Gore Hall. Gore Hall was a little drunk by now, not much, but loud and cheerful. The mayor was feeling good, too, and was affectionately patting the Capellan's great furry shoulder. I want you to understand, Garris was saying earnestly, that I'm sorry about that stupid bull of mine when I first saw you. We're all sorry, seeing how much you've done for us. Listen, we haven't done much, said Gore Hall when Keniston had translated. But the lights and all will make you more comfortable here while you're waiting. Keniston stared at him. What do you mean, while we're waiting?" "'Why, while you're waiting to be evacuated, of course,' said Gore. There was a little silence. Keniston felt a queer tension seize him, and he knew suddenly that this was something he'd been unconsciously expecting, something that he'd felt wasn't quite right all along. He said carefully, "'Gore, we don't understand this. What is this talk of evacuation?" The big Capellan stared at him, with surprise in his large dark eyes and bear-like face. But of a sudden, Keniston felt that that surprise was completely assumed, that in this offhand, casual way, Gore Hall was springing something on them and watching for their reaction. "'Didn't Piers tell you?' said Gore Hall. No, I suppose he'd have instructions not to. They'd figure you people were emotional primitives like Magro and me, and that the less time you have to think about it, the better." Keniston said tightly again, "'What do you mean by evacuation?' 
The Capellan looked at him levelly now. I simply mean that, by order of the governors, all you people are to be evacuated from Earth to some other star world. End of chapter 11